Good afternoon, brethren. Okay, before we begin our study, may we have a word of prayer. Amen. Okay. Um, in this study, we are going to look at uh, at our reform line, as we have been. Uh, Looking at the reform lines, uh, one of the lessons which we saw from the beginning is that it is the work of Christ in uh, preparing a group of people, a group of people whom He is going to call by His name, and then whom He is going to use to spread the light that God would have given them in the time which they are living in. And uh, as we are going to begin, we. Read in Great Controversy, page 343. It says, The work of God in the earth presents from age to age, that is from generation to generation, a striking similarity in every great reformation or religious movement. The principles of God's dealing with men are ever the same. The important movements of the present have their parallel in those of the past. And the experience of the church in former ages has lessons of great value for our own time. So God desires us to know that for us, as, the, as God is going to have his own people who are going to be called by his name, who are his church, the way how he deals with them, it is the same how he dealt with his church in the ages past. And... Uh, the Lord continues saying, even the prophets, that is when God was unfolding the truths to, the peop to his people in the time in which they were living in, using the prophets, it says here, even the prophets who were favored with the special illumination of the Spirit did not fully comprehend the input, the import of the revelations committed to them. The meaning was to be unfolded from age to age as the people of God should need instruction therein contained. Like as we began with the line of Moses, we saw that the line of Moses was the antitype, and the line of Christ is the type. You still remember that there uh, are striking similarities in the birth of Moses and the birth of Christ. Yeah. Moses and the birth of Christ. So this was the antitype. Sorry, this was the type. Thank you. And this was the antitype. This is the fulfillment of that which the line of Moses was teaching. So when you look at the lessons which God was giving to his people in these different reformatory movements, the line of Moses, it teaches about the law of God, the way how God was preparing his people to receive his law. And the line of Cyrus, that is the second line, it teaches about the decrees, how these decrees were unfolding when God was preparing his people to do what? To go and rebuild the temple. And when you look at the, the line of Christ, it teaches about the, the temple cleansings, that is when God was announcing the work that he, was, he wanted to do in the hearts of men. When you look at um, the line of the Millerites, it teaches about the parable of Matthew 25 as we looked into it. And in that parable, it is in light of the unfolding of the light of the first and the second angel's messages as we studied about the seven thunders that within the first and the, seven, first and the second angel's messages, 
there were the seven thunders and these are the events which God was unfolding as he was giving light to his people as they needed it, leading them away to the third angel's message. So when you come to our line, as uh, we read in the second portion of the code, which is in Great Controversy 344, where the last portion where it says, the meaning was to be unfolded from age to age, as the people of God should need the instruction therein contained. So as God, as we began, we saw that uh, Christ is going to come unto us as the what? As the former and the latter reign. So all these lessons are the lessons of the past. They are the former, all of them. Because when you come to the line of the Millerites, when God gave our fathers these truths which are contained in these charts, these truths are the whole Bible. And as these truths are the whole Bible, these were the foundation of the Seventh-day Adventist Church. So as we were looking at uh, these reform lines that always, before God gives light to his people, there is a time of darkness which precedes being given to the people of God. So when you come to our line, our line, you need to take all the lessons which are found here, all of them, they are combined. And God is going to teach us what he desires us to see in this time which we are living in. Because we are repeating all these lessons they are for us. Because when you read in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, in 1 Corinthians 10 verse 11, <clears throat> it reads as follows. Now all these things happened unto them for ensamples, that is for types, and they are written for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world are come. Then verse 12 says, Wherefore, let him that thinketh that he standeth take heed lest he fall. Why would God first of all tell us that all these things happen to them for uh, for types, that is for ensembles, and then he comes and says, let him who thinks he's standing be careful lest you fall. It is because when you zoom in into these lessons, there were people who were always thinking that they could, they were standing. But lo and behold, they will come, they will come to a point when they will depart from the Lord. Like this can be seen also in the line of the Millerites. When you look at the lessons which are being taught like uh, by the previous speakers. Now, as we say that in, uh, in the lines that we have learned, always before God gives his light to his people, there is a period of darkness. So even with us, before the, uh, the mentioning of the date which was mentioned by the previous speaker, that is 1989, there is a period of darkness. And how do we recognize this darkness? By the lessons of the what? Of the past. Now, here is another lesson which you find here in uh, Great Controversy, page 586. It says, The iniquity and spiritual darkness that prevailed under the supremacy of Rome were the inevitable result of her suppression of the scriptures. But where is to be found the cause of the widespread infidelity? the rejection of the law of God, and the consequent corruption under the full blaze of gospel light in an age of religious freedom. So she is speaking of our time, we are living in an age of religious freedom. So how is this transpiring that Satan is going to remove the scriptures out of our sight? She says, now that Satan can no longer keep the world under his control by withholding the scriptures, he resorts to the other means to accomplish the same object. So which same object does Satan desire to accomplish? To hide the scriptures. But we are told that the scriptures are everywhere. So how is he going to accomplish that? She says, to destroy faith in the Bible that serves his purpose as well as to destroy the Bible itself. So what is it that Satan is going to destroy? which is the same thing that transpired before, during the time of uh, the 1260, that is the Dark Ages. During the Dark Ages, Satan took away the Bible. 
but we are told what is he going to do in our time? Destroy the faith. He's going to destroy the faith. Let's read in the book of Jude 1 verse 3. In Jude 1 verse 3, what is this faith that Satan uh, will destroy? In the book of Jude chapter uh, 1 verse 3, it says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. So there is a faith which God delivered unto the saints, that is unto the, our forefathers. That faith, God in the book of Jude said we must do what? Earnestly contend for it because Satan will strive to change it. By changing it, he is actually changing also the scriptures because we are told here about what transpired before uh, Christ came, that is in the history of the Jews. That is one of the things that Satan did. It says here in uh, Deserve Ages, page 35, through heathenism, Satan had for ages turned men away from God. But he won his great triumph in perverting the faith of Israel. So Satan, in this time, what did he do? He perverted the faith of Israel. So by perverting that faith, that faith which made them who they were, he actually, like during this period, changed the scriptures. Because in our time, when God was working with our fathers during this history of the Millerites, the faith that God gave them, the faith or the truths that made them Seventh-day Adventists are these truths. So Satan, by changing these truths, is changing the gospel. And one thing which the Bible and the testimonies teach is this, that the law and the gospel is one thing. The law is the gospel embodied. And the gospel is the law which is being unfolded. So when he changes either of them, he is actually leading people into darkness. So our church, by the time when God gave our fathers these truths, these truths began to be changed. So then there was a period of darkness. That's why we became Laodicea Church. So at this point, there was darkness. And as we learned from the previous speaker, that uh, 1798, it goes hand in hand with which year? From the previous speaker when he was teaching about Daniel 1140. Which year? 1989. So we read in the Next quote, it says, uh, speaking about our faith, the truth that made us who we are, it says, The burden of our work now is not to labor for those who, although they have had abundant light and evidence, still continue on the unbelieving side. God bids us give our time and strength to the work of preaching to the people. The messages that steered men and women in 1843 and 1844. God calls upon us to make known to all men the truths that have made us what we are, Seventh-day Adventists. So those truths which made us what we are, when Satan changes them, we will be led into a period of darkness. So um, 1989, it marks the time of the end. That is the time when God is beginning to give light unto his people. When the truth of Daniel 11, 40, began to be unfolded. When the truth of Daniel 11, 40 began to be unfolded. <clears throat> and as we have been learning also from the previous lines, whenever God begins to unfold the truths, there is a period of what? Of the increase of knowledge. <laughs> and 
And uh, as this knowledge was increasing, as we read in the code that they are striking similarities, so as this knowledge was increasing pertaining to Daniel 11.40, then there came uh, the year 1996, when uh, the truths of Daniel 11.40 were combined into an article called the time of the end. So in this year, the truths of the magazine called Time of the End were combined. Now when we go to Jeremiah 6.16, in Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 16. Now from the previous speaker, what did, what did he say Daniel 11.40 was pointing to? Remember, at this point when God began to unfold Daniel 8.14 in the history of our fathers, the history of the Millerites, where was Daniel 8.14 Daniel pointing to? Where was it pointing to? To the most holy place, to the time when judgment is going to come. And uh, with the correct understanding of, as, we, as it was dealt with in, uh, in great detail, it pointed to 22 October 1844. So why am I desiring us to see this? The message that God unfolds, it has a, an event which it is pointing to. So the previous speaker, what did he say this truth was pointing to? Daniel 11.40. Where did he say it was pointing to? To the Sunday law. So as these truths began to be unfolded, then the event which came next after this is, uh, it was September 11. September, okay. Uh, it was 9 September 2001. Oh. Eleven September, sorry, thank you. Eleven September, 2001. And as we read in uh, Jeremiah 6, verse 16, it reads as follows. Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways, and see, and ask for the old paths, ways the good way, and walk therein and you shall find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk therein. So as, uh, as we started that Daniel 11.40, it was pointing to where? To the event which was imminently coming. And uh, that event which is contained there, it is the Sunday law. What is it that transpired on 9-11, uh, which was prefiguring that, uh, that which Daniel 11.40 was pointing to almost came to pass? It was the Patriotic Act. <laughs> and uh, as this transpired within the nation of America, within the Church of God, something also transpired. It was uh, spiritualism. Spiritualism took part at this point. Or you can uh, term it spiritual formation. <coughs> now, the, in Prophets and Kings, page 411, when she's commenting on Jeremiah 6.16, it says, Jeremiah called their attention. So when Jeremiah was speaking the words which are contained in Jeremiah 16, the reason why he was doing so, 
She says, Jeremiah called their attention repeatedly to the counsels given in Deuteronomy. More than any other of the prophets, he emphasized the teachings of the Mosaic law and showed how these might bring the highest spiritual blessing to the nation and to every individual heart. Ask for the old paths, ways the good way and walk therein. He, he pleaded, and you shall find rest for your souls. So when Jeremiah was giving this lesson up to, the, to, his, to the people of his time, telling them to ask of the old paths, for us, which old paths are we supposed to ask for, which are in light of this event which transpired on this day and year? What is it that transpired on this day and year, which was taught by the previous speaker? The falling of the towers, which was caused by what? Islam. By Islam. Is there, where do you find that lesson of Islam in the past? In the his, which history? The history of our fathers. So when God says, ask ye of the old past, which old past is he referring us to in light of what transpired during this time? This history. So God is referring us to go back to this history in light of the event which transpired here to know what is it that caused this and what transpired when the event of the same caliber transpired on 11 August 1840. So when you, go, when you read in uh, Hosea chapter 6 verse 1 to 3, as we looked into this that the old paths are the... Um, are the former ways, the former things, the things of old. And uh, in uh, Hosea chapter 6, verse 1 to 3, it says, Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smit, sorry, come and let us return unto the Lord, for he has torn and he will heal us. He has smitten and he will bind us up. After two days he will revive us, and in the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Then shall we know, if we follow on to know the Lord, his going forth is prepared as the morning, and he shall come unto us as the rain, as the latter, and the former rain unto the earth. So when God is referring his people to the old parts, he is referring them to what? To the former rain. That's where he is referring them to. So here God is calling his people to go back to the uh, old paths. The former rain. It says in uh, early writings to 59, um, as we are looking into the history of the Millerites, where the event of Islam was fulfilled, that is 11 August 1840, what is it that transpired? We saw that the message which was being preached by Miller in advance to 11 August 1840, it confirmed that the rules which Miller was using, which God had given him, or the day-year principle, it was what? Correct. So also, when this message was formalized here, as it was being preached, it, when this event transpired, what did it confirm? That that which God was warning to his people is what? Is correct. So here, the message arrives. Uh, the message is preached. And then at this time, the message is confirmed. And it says here in early writings 259, paragraph 1, when she is commenting about the, uh, the history of the time of Christ, it says, I was pointed back to the proclamation of the first advent of Christ. John was sent in the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way of Jesus. Those who rejected the testimony of John were not benefited by the teachings 
of Jesus. Uh, combining it with the next, it says, All heaven watched with deepest interest the reception of the first angel's message. But many who professed to love Jesus and who shed tears as they read the story of the cross derided the good news of his coming. Instead of receiving the message with gladness, they declared it to be a delusion. They hated those who loved his appearing and shut them out of the churches. Those who rejected the first message could not be benefited by the second. Neither were they benefited by the midnight cry, which was to prepare them to enter with Jesus by faith into the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary. So, as these quotes which I have read, one thing which we learn is that uh, God is showing us as, this thing, as at this time, it's a repeat of 11 August 1840 and the time of baptism. At this point, the message of John is confirmed to be true by the baptism of Christ. At this point, the day, the year day principle is confirmed to be true by the, um, by the fall of Islam. And at this point, September 9-11 confirms that the message which was being preached prior to this event, it was confirmed to be true. And as we saw that the people were tested here, so there is a test also at this time period. Because also in the time of Christ, where the people tested when Jesus was baptized, they were tested by what? Christ, when he was teaching them, they were supposed to believe when John was pointing to Christ, he says, Behold the Lamb of God. When he was baptized and when his ministry was going forth, Jesus would refer people back to John. The reason why he would do so is if they believed John, they would have believed the message of Christ. So when God is testing us, he is testing us with, if you, believed, if you believe that what this message was pointing to is correct, then the test has come. So the people who began to understand the message here, they began to be what? To be tested. Um, in uh, Testimonies, volume 8, page 297, it says, Thus says the Lord, stand ye in the ways and see and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way? And walk therein. Let none seek to tear away the foundations of our faith. The foundations that were laid at the beginning of our work by prayerful study of the word and by revelation. Upon these, foundation, these foundations we have been building for the last 50 years. Men may suppose that they have found a new way and that they can lay a stronger foundation than that which has been laid. But this is a great deception. Other foundation can no man lay than that which, was, which, has, which has been laid, sorry, than that which has been laid. So when God is referring us back to the old parts, he is showing us that the foundation which God laid during this history, it was a correct foundation. So as the people of God, they began to be tested and God refers them back to the foundation which was laid in the time of their fathers. God now desires us to understand this history in a correct manner because this history is now repeating upon this, this time period. So all these truths, we were called forth to understand them correctly because when the test begins to come, we didn't understand not only this message, but even the old parts which are a reflection of what is transpiring at this time. So God is calling for these people to do what? To go back to the old past and understand those messages correctly. So at, um, at this time period, just as in the past, the second angel's message, um, it arrived. The second angel's message, it arrived. Uh, to... If you go to 5MR, page 202. 5MR, page 202. Because if you look at uh, 
this line, the line of our fathers, the line of the Millerites. After 11 August 1840, we learned that this chart was made. And this chart was containing the truths that our fathers were giving to the people of that time. So in, uh, in the year 2007, when God referred us back to the old parts, these charts began to be found. And these charts began to be studied and to be understood. So at this point, the truths on the charts, they began to be what? To be preached, the old parts. They began to be preached. So it says here in uh, 5MR204, pertaining to the truths which are on the chart, it says, God showed me the necessity of getting out a chart that I saw it was needed and the truth made plain upon tables would affect much and will cause souls to come to the knowledge of the truth. That is for us, for them, they were, when these truths, the truths on this chart were being given to the people, God says the more these truths were being given to them, the people will come to the knowledge of the truth. But for us, we will come to the knowledge of the first, the second, and the third angel's message as they were preached in the past. Because what God says is, we don't have a new message. Because as we learned that the latter rain comes out of what? The former rain. The new truth comes out of the old. There is no new thing under the sun. That's what the Bible says in Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 9. So as there is no new thing, when God was referring us to the old past, he desired us to understand that as we began to understand the old past, these truths which are here began to be preached. As they began to be preached, it says on the uh, next quotation, which is found in 5MR, also page 203, it says, On our return to, the, to Brother Nichols, the Lord gave me a vision and showed me that the truth must be made plain upon tables, and it will cause many to decide for the truth by the third angel's message with the two former being made plain upon tables. So she was commenting on this chart. How many truths, how many angels were contained in this chart according to this quote? How many truths were contained in this chart, the 1850 chart, according to this quote? It was three messages, because she says here that the Lord gave me a vision and showed me that the truth must be made plain upon tables, and it will cause many to decide for the truth by the third angel's message, with the two former being made plain upon tables. So on these two tables is the whole three angels' messages. So as these truths began to be known in this time, and as we are living under the period of the third angel's message, because the third angel's message, it arrived in 22 October. That's why we wrote the third year is confirmed to be true, and then it arrived at this point. So the people whom God is dealing with here, they are living under the period of the third angel's message. So as God is referring us to the old parts, he is not destroying what he is giving us at this time period, but he is confirming and bringing us to an understanding of what is about to befall us when the event which is pointed by Daniel 11.40 comes. So as God's desire in the previous lines was always to prepare his people for the coming event, so even in this time period, when God begins to refer his people to the past, to the old parts, he is desiring to prepare them for the event which is pointed by this message that it is coming, so that they prepare for it. So as it was in the line of the Millerites, that under the first and the second angel's messages, God helped them to identify the correct time when that event which is pointed by the first and the second is going to transpire. That is Christ coming into the most holy place. So when this message came, the second angel's message came, it helped God's people to understand when the event which is pointed by the first angel's message is going to transpire, as we are going to see. Um, 
So in the and these truths, as these truths began to be understood and to be studied, in the year uh, 2014, these truths began to they were, they were confirmed. That is the second angel's message, the truths on the charts, the old parts, they began to be confirmed. And that which helped them to be confirmed was the understanding of Ezra 7, 9. As you go back here, what helped Samuel S. know to identify the correct date when Christ is going to enter into the most holy place according to Daniel 8, 14, the first angel? It was Ezra 7, 9. So also here, Ezra 7, 9 began to be understood. And with the understanding of Ezra 7, 9, that which transpired in the, in the time of the Millerites, it helped us also to understand which, how does God desire us to understand at which period is this event which is pointed by the first angel's message is going to happen. So it says here in the next quotation, in Great Controversy, page 392, no one, however, then noticed that an apparent delay in the accomplishment of the vision, a tearing time is presented in the same prophecy. After the disappointment, this scripture appeared very significant. The vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. The just shall live by his faith. A portion of Ezekiel's prophecy was also a source of strength and comfort to believers. The word of the Lord came unto me, saying, Son of man, what is that proverb that you have in the land of Israel, saying, The days are prolonged, and every vision faileth? Tell them, therefore, Thus says the Lord God, The days are at hand, and the effect of every vision. I will speak, and the word that I shall speak shall come to pass. It shall be no more prolonged. They of the house of Israel say the vision that he seeth is for many days to come. And he prophesieth of the times that are far off. Therefore say, un say unto them, Thus says the Lord God, There shall none of my words be prolonged any more, but the word which I have spoken shall be done. So when this, these truths began to be opened up, like in the time of the Millerites, one thing which they understood is that under the third angel's message, there is going to be the effect of every vision. But uh, because um, they didn't follow on to know the Lord as God desired, those things did not transpire as God had planned. But when God is bringing these lessons unto us in our time, he desires us to see that when, the, when that which Daniel 11 40 is pointing to comes to pass, it will be a time of the effect of every vision. That is, it will be the repeat of all the histories of the Bible as depicted by the third angel's message here. So, as we, as we are writing these dates, it's not, it's not that when these dates we wrote them as that date, as that year came. But when we look back and we begin to see that we are repeating the history of the Millerites in detail, we begin to see that when during these years, that's where God was unfolding the truths as he was doing to our fathers in the past. So at this point, when the second angel's message is confirmed, the third angel's message arrived, just as it did in uh, 19 April, um, the truths about when the bridegroom is going to come began to be understood. And here, <clears throat> we see that Daniel 11.40 is pointing to the Sunday law. And the third angel's message, what does, this, what does it warn us of? Does it warn of the Sunday law which is coming? Yes, it does. So when the truths began to be opened up here, God helped us to understand how to identify when this event is going to transpire. So in this next quote, it says, speaking about um, the work of the third angel's message, it says, to us as God's people, okay, this is uh, Life Sketches, page 423. It says, to us as God's servants, he has been entrusted 
the Therangeous message, the binding of message. So as God began to unfold the truths of the Therangeous message, which are contained in the Therangeous message, just like in the past when God gave our fathers the Therangeous message, he entrusted them the work that they were going to do after 1844 going forward, it is going to be spoken of uh, by the next speaker. So when God is beginning to unfold these truths, he is desiring to prepare a people whom he is going to use to unfold those truths so that they come, so that they be used by God to preach those messages. Because it's not going to be everyone whom God is going to use. It is only those whom God is going to entrust. So in this quote, uh, God says, to us, as God's people, he has been entrusted the Therangeous message, the binding of message. So at this point, uh, the truths pertaining the binding of uh, began to be unfolded. They began uh, to be unfolded. It continues saying, the binding of message that is to prepare a people for the coming of our king. Time is short. The Lord desires that everything connected with his cause shall be brought into order. He desires that the solemn message of warning and of invitation shall be proclaimed as widely as his messengers can carry it. The means, the means that shall come into the treasury is to be used wisely in supporting the workers. Nothing should be, nothing that would hinder the advance of the message is to be allowed to come into our planning. So when God began to unfold the truths pertaining the binding of, what the binding of teaches, it is uh, one of the studies which is going to be dealt with in detail. It is the finishing work of the Therangeous message. It is Christ when he's finishing up his work that he has begun doing in his people. So when God began to unfold these truths, he is also desiring to prepare his people so that they be ready for that time when that time comes, when God is finishing up his work so that they be part and parcel when God is finishing that work. So in the next quote it says, <clears throat> All over our land, the Lord is honest souls who are standing in uncertainty. The words were spoken. Repeat the messages in their order. Tell my people to proclaim the message, the binding of message that is to prepare a people for the coming of the king. So when God is going to give that message, the binding of message, which is the Therangeous message, when that event comes, what is the purpose of that message? According to this quote, to prepare a people for the coming of the king. This is everyone's hope and desire, to be ready for the coming of the king. But we can't be ready for the coming of the king if we don't receive the messages in their order. That's what God is showing. So when we are giving, when God is showing us these reform lines as he gives his messages in their order. Remember when it was being, we were being taught by Brother Fiodo about the seven thunders, that the messages were given in their what? In their order. God will not give a light before his people understand that light which has given them at that present moment. So the binding of truths which God began to open up, showing us when it is going to happen, when this event comes, God is even teaching us today and telling us that for us to be prepared for that event, we need to receive the messages in their order. He says, give the world a knowledge of the messages of the first, second, and third angels. Bind up the law among my disciples. There are many who will listen because men will speak under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You are 20 years behind, but let the warning voice now be heard speaking with the voice of assurance. Now when God is saying that, uh, bind up the law among my disciples, it's a, it's a phrase which is taken in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16. If we go to Isaiah 8, verse 16. 
in Isaiah 8 verse 16 it says Isaiah 8 uh, verse 16 bind up the testimony seal the law among my disciples when you go into the testimonies many a times God when he's commenting on this verse about binding up the testimony, sealing the law among his disciples, it is a time of sealing. So, and, uh, and uh, she says also it's a time of the latter rain. And which angel, as we were going through the studies, which angel is the angel of the latter rain? Revelation 18. So these truths which God began to open up here, they were pointing when the angel of Revelation 18 is going to come. And as we read this quote, it says, The closing work of the third angel's message will be attended with a power that will send the rays of the Son of Righteousness into all the highways and byways of life. And decisions will be made for God as supreme governor. His law will be looked upon as the rule of his government. And then it says here in letter 97, the theme of the greatest importance is the third angel's message, embracing the messages of the first and second angels. All should understand the truths contained in these messages, for they are essential for our salvation. So these truths which God says we need to understand, God says they are essential for our salvation. All of us must know them. It says we shall have to study earnestly in order to understand these truths and our power to learn and comprehend will be taxed to the uttermost. So our minds need to be taxed in understanding these truths. As we are going to be going on studying these things uh, during the following studies, we will really see that our minds need to be taxed to understand these truths pertaining the binding of messages, this, this structure which God is going to open up unto us realizing what is going to transpire when that event comes. Um, <clears throat> As we read that uh, the binding of message, it prepares people for the coming of the king. And uh, when is this going to transpire? It says in the next quote in our Christ Object Lesson, page 414, the coming of the bridegroom was at midnight, the darkest hour. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. So, as we, as God says that the truths pertaining to the third angel's message, when they begin to be unfolded, in, uh, in the year 2016, these truths began to be preached. And from this quote which you have read, God shows that the coming of Christ will be at midnight. And as we read on, it explains why it is so. So the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. Now, as we learned that this, when Christ is pointing us back to the old paths, he's pointing us to what? To the former reign. And remember, Christ comes as the what, according to Hosea chapter 6? As the former and the latter reign. So when, when God says here that the coming of the bridegroom, that is the coming of Christ, was at midnight, the darkest hour, so the coming of Christ will take place in the darkest period of this earth's history. How is Christ going to come? at this point. He is coming as the what? As the latter rain. But as we are going to learn, just like in the... So this is the angel of Revelation 18. Verses 1 to 3. And one thing which is uh, of importance to take note is this. When our fathers were given the third angel's message, did they understand it right on time when they, when they were given it? 
Did our fathers understand the message the moment they were given it? What did they do first? They had to learn it, to study it, and then there comes a time when they now understand it, then they preach it. That's why you see these, uh, a message arrives, a message is preached, and then a message is confirmed. So also here, when this message is going to be given, it is going to be studied, and it is going to be shown in the, in the next study. So this angel is going to come here, and then it is going to be studied. But the Lord says also here that the days of Noah, so why does God say Jesus comes in the darkest period? What is darkness? If you look on the quote on the last portion of it, it says, the great apostasy will develop into darkness deep as midnight. So midnight, which is the darkest hour, is what, according to that phrase? It is a time of what? Great apostasy. What is apostasy? Turning from the truth. That's what God is showing. And these things are going to be learned as we go forward. It says, impenetrable as sackcloth of hair. To God's people it will be a night of trial, a night of weeping, a night of persecution for the truth's sake. But out of that night of darkness, God's light will shine. Which light is going to shine out of darkness at that event? It is the light of the angel of Revelation 18. What does Revelation 18 verse 1 say? John says, I saw another what? Angel coming what? Coming down with what? What did that light do? It lightened the whole earth. Why? Because of darkness. And where is darkness? Is it that there is going to be darkness, like a physical darkness on the earth? No. Look at what this quote says. This, uh, in the same book of Christ Object Lesson, it says, it is the darkness of the misapprehension, sorry, it is, dark, it is the darkness of misapprehension of God that is enshrouding the world. Men are losing their knowledge of his character. So the darkness, it comes because of what? Misunderstanding of what? The character of God. These reform lines, what do they teach? The character of God. So if, so God says that darkness which is going to come there, it is because of a misunderstanding of the character of God. It has been misunderstood and misinterpreted. At this time, a message from God is to be proclaimed. A message illuminating in its influence and saving in its power. His character is to be made known. Into the darkness of the world is to be shared the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. When you read that last, those last phrases, it says the light of his glory, the light of his goodness, mercy, and truth. What is goodness, mercy, and truth? These are attributes of what? Of his character. So that which will be spread to the world, it is the character of God. And that character of God, God says it is the angel of Revelation 18. And it is the, the third angel's message, actually. And these truths which are here, they teach about the character of God. What does the book of Revelation 1 verse 1 says? The revelation of who? Jesus of Jesus Christ. Now look at this quote as we are drawing to a close. This is uh, <clears throat> manuscript 8.1.19.06. It says, All who serve God with purity of soul will know that he is jealous that his honor should be preserved. Many of the most glorious revelations recorded in the Bible were made by the Lord in the darkest days of the church history. So in a dark day of the church history, what does God do? He gives a what? A revelation. And the revelation that he promises to give us is which revelation? 18. 18. That the angel, the latter rain angel. So how do you prepare for that angel? How do you prepare for it? By understanding the former. Because without the former, can you receive the latter? You can't. How do you, how do you receive the latter? By understanding the former. You understand the old, it prepares you to know the new. Like as we were learning in the time of Christ, what made the people of the time of Christ to reject Jesus? It is because they never understood the what? The old. If they had known the old, they were going to receive him. 
So these are the very same lessons which God is giving unto us. And our remedy is to go back to the past. And as God is unfolding these truths in our time, his desire is to prepare us so that we receive that revelation which is going to come with that angel. So finish off, finish, finishing off this quote, he says, The Lord has given these revelations of his glory, of his glory in order that men may be deeply impressed regarding the sacredness of his service. Now, when you go to the book of Isaiah 6, why did God give that revelation to Isaiah? So that he understands the what? The sacredness of God's service. So when God is giving us that revelation, one of the lessons is for us to understand the sacredness of his work. That's why we read the quote is saying, God has entrusted the Therangel's message to his people. For God to entrust you, you must have a correct understanding of the sacredness of his work so that you value it and you place it at its right position. That's what God desires as well. It says, Impressions have been made that should bear with solemn force on the mind, showing that God is God and that he has not lost his glory. He requires the utmost fidelity in his service today. The impression must be left on human minds that the Lord God is holy and that he will vindicate his glory. Now, in closing, one of the points which I will say is this. <clears throat> one of the lessons which you see in uh, all these lines, who is doing the work of reforming his people here? It's, it's Christ. And these lines and these waymarks which are here, they teach that we need to follow the Lord as he is doing that work. We can't run ahead of Christ, but we need to follow his steps just as it was taught on the lesson of the seven thunders, that these steps are designed for us to follow him. Now, when you read in uh, uh, Revelation 10, when that angel, who is Christ, when he came down and uh, shouted with a loud voice as a voice of a lion, what is a voice? Why, why does God mark that, that angel uh, shouted with a loud voice? God says, my sheep hear my what? My voice. And they what? Follow me. How do you follow Christ if we don't know his voice? If we don't correctly understand, these waymarks are designed for us to see how to follow Christ as he's leading us to a point where he wants us to be. How will we follow him if we don't know them? So these lessons are designed by God to see how to follow Christ and to know also where we are in the stream of time and what is required of us. Question. As we say that at this point, the Therangel's message, that is the binding of truths as they were unfolding, they began to be preached. Where are we? Are we before this year or after? So what is it that is coming like fast upon us? Exactly, there was a shut door here. There is going to be a shut door here. So this shut door, it shut, it shut on which people? Those who, Those who rejected these messages, it shut upon them. So also here, there is going to be a shut door. And all these lessons, what they teach is we need to have faith in the word of God. Because if we despise that there is going to be a shut door, it shows that we despise all these things that God teaches us in the past, like in this history. But one of the lessons is we need now to spend more time on our knees and on our feet studying the word of God, understanding what God requires of us as we are drawing close to this event. Because if we don't pass the test, the door is going to shut upon us. And there will be no excuse for us. So as we are learning these lessons, it is our desire that each and every one of us, we are not saying that we have won the race. We are also amid the race and we are calling others to join as we are drawing close to that door which is going to be shut. But God in his mercy, he is giving us time so that we understand these things and see how we can be ready for that event. 
But as we, these lessons actually they are going to be unfolded in, uh, in the studies which are going to follow today and also tomorrow. So with these words I will say, uh, let us close our eyes and pray.